Good morning. I want to uh, welcome everybody. I have uh, two brief opening statements which I'd like to read into the record and then we'll hear from our Parks Commissioner. Good morning and welcome to the first meeting of the New York City Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation for 2018. My name is Barry Grudenchek and I'm honored to be the chair of the committee for this council term. The parks of the city of New York are universally loved by the eight and a half million people residing in the five boroughs of this great city and are enjoyed by millions more people who visit New York City every year. From Fort Totten Park in Northeast Queens to Conference House Park in Tottenville, Staten Island, from the great stretches of Van Cortland and Pelham Bay Parks in the Bronx to the beaches of Coney Island and the Rockaway Peninsula, and of course our crown jewel Central Park, every park in this city matters and is going to matter as we go forward. The numbers on parks are both amazing and staggering. Parks in the city of New York are 14% of all the land in the city, over 30,000 acres representing over 5,000 individual properties. There are more than 800 athletic fields, more than 1,000 playgrounds, over 550 tennis courts, 67 pools, 50 recreation facilities, 17 nature centers, 14 miles of beaches, and perhaps most importantly for me, 13 golf courses. It has been said that our parks are the lungs of our city. They are that and so much more. They are a young child learning to swim or play tennis, older children playing baseball and softball, cricketeers playing for hours and hours on end, older folks playing bocce, the next Dr. J, you can see how old I am, playing on our basketball courts, parents with young children walking trails in our forever wild forest, hundreds and hundreds of children playing soccer, in Flushing Meadows Corona Park, countless youngsters using our playgrounds, children learning about our environment at one of our 17 aforementioned nature, cent nature centers, ice skating, mountain biking, cross-country skiing, historic homes, world-famous cultural institutions and offering muskrats, beavers, turtles, deer, a osprey and the odd coyote and even a hacker like me playing golf. And even with this exhausting list, we're just scratching the surface. Today, this committee will be hearing on the, the progress on the Mayor's Community Parks Initiative, which was rolled out by Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner Silver on October 7, 2014 in Bound Park in Flushing in Council Member Peter Coos District. I look forward to getting a status report from the Parks Department today on the work that has taken place. I also look forward to hearing from park lovers and advocates who will share with us their impressions on this initiative. As we move forward through this calendar year and into the following three years, this committee is going to examine many topics, none more th important than the capital construction process for parks, which frankly has left much to be desired both for the cost of each project and the seemingly inordinate amount of time projects take to get to fruition. That hearing of hearings will be conducted jointly with the Oversight and Investigations Committee, the Contracts Committee, as well as the Capital Budget Subcommittee. I also expect to hold hearings on a myriad of topics, including our city trees, their planting, their pruning, and when needed, their removal and that of their stumps. We will conduct hearings on our historic houses and our beaches and our boardwalks for starters. Next month, our hearing will be on the preliminary budget. I also invite the residents of the city to contact me with ideas and topics they would like to see this committee take a closer look at. Since becoming chair, it has been my pleasure to meet with dozens of advocates who care so much about the parks and the public lands of our city. This past Saturday, I was honored to be at the Bronx Speak Up with Commissioner Silver and Bronx Commissioner Iris Rodriguez Rosa. It was wonderful to see so many people who care about our parks and their parks. The expertise of the people I have met with has provided me with invaluable guidance and insight about the state of our parks and, of course, how we can make them better. My life was to a large measure molded by my experience at Pominock Playground where I grew up. My experience is the same of, as untold millions of others whose lives were made so much better because of a New York City park. As chair of this committee, I will carry their hopes and dreams as we work together, all of us, to make our parks the very best they can be. I look forward very much so to continuing this dialogue in the weeks, months, and years ahead. This morning's hearing is on the Community Parks Initiative, as I said, and I will now read a short introduction to today's hearing on that topic. We have been joined so far by uh, Mr. Andrew Cohn from the Bronx and Mr. Peter Koo uh, from Flushing. I actually mentioned you, Peter, this morning, and I mentioned one of your parks. 
Uh, over the course of the last few decades, the city has gradually reduced its contribution to the park system as the share of parks funding in the city's budget fell from 1.5% in the 1960s to 0.86% in the mid-80s to 0.5% by the year 2013. While the recent parks budget was the largest ever in terms of the dollar amount at about $560 million, it still only represents about 0.6% of the entire expense budget. The trend over the last few decades has been to rely more and more on private dollars to fund our parks through the use of conservancies and other private groups to operate parks. But the rise of conservancies and an improving fiscal condition for the city did not bring about a rebound in the funding for the park system as a whole. The consequence of increased private funding was that it dampened the political will of the city for robust public funding of the Parks Department, resulting in a stagnant parks budget that which has left disparities in how we maintain, build, staff, police, and fund our parks. While the landmark destination parks such as Central Park, Prospect Park, and the High Line, among others, have flourished, many of our smaller parks have not. So one of our biggest challenges is to achieve adequate funding for neighborhood parks. And to do this, there is simply no avoiding to begin restoring the city's parks budget back to historic levels. That's where the Department of Parks and Recreation's equity initiative, specifically the Community Parks and Anchor Parks initiative, come in. The initiative was the first phase of DPR's framework for an ep equitable future plan to address park equity initiatives by improving the distribution and resources in the city park system. In deciding where to focus the initiative, DPR designated zones located in communities with high percentages of residents who have income levels below the poverty line and then identified parks that had received less than a quarter million dollars of capital funding over the last 20 years. The process at first resulted in 134 parks identified in lower income areas that had capital needs, with 35 small parks being prioritized for reconstruction. The initiative was originally funded in FY15 with a $130 million capital investment, of which $9.4 million was council funding, and leveraged through an additional $20 million in funds from elected officials and grant sources. The city then increased funding for CPI for FY16 to $289 million in capital through 2019, combined with sustainable annual commitment of over $2.5 million in expense funding. This increased the number of parks that were scheduled for renovations to 67 from the original 35. Of the 35 initial parks that were included in CPI, 12 parks projects were expected to be completed by the end of last year. The 12 parks announced in 2015 are in procurement and are expected to enter construction this year, and the nine announced in 2016 will enter procurement this year. The final 11 parks are expected to be completed in the winter of 2021. 2020-21. Uh, regarding anchor parks, $150 million in major improvements to five parks are under this, initiatives, this initiative. The five parks included in the anchor parks initiative were St. Mary's Park in the Bronx, High Bridge Park in Manhattan, Betsy Head Park in Brooklyn, Astoria Park in Queens, and Fresh Kills Park on Staten Island. Under the initiative, each park was selected based on high surrounding population, historic underinvestment, and potential for park development, and each received for approximately $30 million in major improvements, including new soccer fields, comfort stations, running tracks, and hiking trails. These initiatives are important if we hope to increase public commitments to ensure all parks are properly funded and maintained. There are numerous questions that need to be explored at this hearing, including whether the initiative will ensure that targeted parks be well maintained over the long run, Will the administration commit to expanding these initiatives to cover more parks in the future? What staff allocations are and will be going forward? How will projects be completed in a timely fashion? Whether the initiative will lead to increased sustained funding in the future rather than just one-time funding allocations to more properly ensure that fewer parks are neglected over time. Additionally, the early evidence seems to indicate that many CPI projects are proceeding at faster rates than what has been the case for other non-mayoral prioritized capital projects. If that is the case, then maybe CPI can act as a teachable moment for DPR and the city to learn how to speed up all funded capital projects, which all too often languish for years before proceeding properly. Let's hope that we never return to the days that where the parks are now targeted for renovation, that are now targeted for renovation 
are neglected over multiple decades. I look forward to finding answers to these questions at this hearing and examining what other possibilities there are out there to continue on a path for greater equity for all of our parks. I'd like to begin now by welcoming Commissioner Silver and his staffer. Um, and I'm going to ask the committee, chair, committee council to swear in uh, the first panel. Chris Sartori, committee council. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. Good morning, Commissioner, and please begin. Good morning, Chair Grudenczyk and members of the Parks Committee. Uh, Chair, you were very thorough in your opening, and so I apologize if I uh, appear redundant in some of my comments as That's I okay. talk about some of the various initiatives. Uh, my name is Mitchell Silver. I'm the New York City Parks and Recreation Commissioner. Thank you for inviting me here today to talk about our equity initiatives. Uh, I just have to say up front that uh, one of the major reasons I took this job in the first place and returned to New York was the mayor's vision for equity. So I will be sharing information about the Community Parks Initiative, Parks Without Borders, uh, our anchor parks, and then our other initiatives to ensure that we are being equitable uh, in the agency. Uh, from my point of view, equity means fairness. Are we fair about how we distribute our resources? Are we fair about how we maintain our parks? Uh, this serves as our guiding principle for the administration as reflected in well-publicized efforts to build and preserve affordable housing, provide universal pre-K and 3K, and keep our streets safer through Vision Zero. But this commitment to equity also infuses and informs everything we do as an agency here at New York City Parks. For many years, the benefits of our park system, so vital to our city's health and happiness, were not enjoyed equally by all New Yorkers. For many of us, our city parks serve as our front yard, our backyard, our vacation destination. Thanks to the leadership of Mayor Bill de Blasio and through the strong partnership with the city council and borough presidents, we've made tremendous progress over the past four years in fulfilling our commitment to a more inclusive and innovative park system. We've demonstrated our commitment to equity early on in the administration. In the fall of 2014, shortly after my arrival as commissioner, NYC Parks announced a strategic framework which embodies those priority values, our framework for an equitable future. This framework outlined our commitment to create and care for thriving, vibrant public spaces for all New Yorkers, providing programming for neighborhoods in need, standardize our maintenance efforts across the park system, expand public access to green and open space. The framework for an equitable future continues to serve as our agency's blueprint, guiding our efforts to protect the investments in parks that we've already made while improving the quality, accessibility, resiliency, and sustainability of the overall park system that serves New York City's diverse neighborhoods. It's also spurred our efforts to pro prioritize public input and increase community stakeholder engagement so we can hear directly from the users and visitors that benefit from these parks and develop innovative and data-driven approaches, design, plan, develop, and care for our parks. Most notably, the framework called the Strategic Allocation of City Capital Investment to benefit high-need communities and park properties that had seen little to no investment in decades. To accomplish this goal, the framework for an equitable future included a signature program the Community Parks Initiative, also known as CPI. Since launching CPI in late 2014, the city has allocated more than $318 million in mayoral funding through the Community Parks Initiative dedicated to delivering capital improvements, enhanced programming, maintenance, and community partnership, and to develop neighborhood parks that need it most in a way that is inclusive and equitable. The amazingly transformative impact of CPI is already being felt in communities all over the city. As, as New Yorkers see the parks they have been ignored and unloved become an amazing green open space that all New Yorkers deserve. Through CPI, we are fully reconstructing 67 neighborhood parks and playgrounds where traditional capital projects often focus on replacing a singular park feature or amenity. CPI has allowed us to completely reimagine these parks some of which resemble parking lots more than parks. And with the help of community members to create accessible, multi-generational spaces for New Yorkers. Building on our broader commitment to streamline the capital process and keep parks projects moving, 
I'm pleased to update you that all of these major projects are all well underway. 14 CPA projects are already complete and have reopened to the public with additional sites reopening very soon. In fact, on Tuesday, March 20th, we'll be holding a ribbon cutting relay ceremonies in five CPA parks across the city, one in each borough, during the exciting all day sprint across the city. And we invite all of you to join us for that exciting day. The first neighborhood playground to be fully reconstructed and reopened as part of this initiative was Van All's Playground in Astoria. It was completed ahead of schedule in June of 2017 after an investment of $3.5 million. It is now a major amenity for the community adjacent to PS 171. Another striking example of the CPI reconstruction is Thomas Boylan Park in Bushwick. As the presentation on the screen shows, this site saw dramatic improvements including a reconstructed baseball diamond and a resurfaced and updated basketball court. These 67 projects were identified with a data-driven approach that prioritized equity. At the outset of the program in 2014, we took a close look at the city's historic capital investment in parks and discovered that this investment did not always reach the communities that needed it most. Identifying parks and playgrounds that received less than 200 and 50,000 capital during the previous 20 years. When we use de demographic data to define high need communities with above average rates of population, density, and percentage of residents living below the federal poverty line. In this manner, we developed a target list of public spaces that fit within these criteria. Through CPI, we have been able to use in-house crews to provide targeted physical improvements in additional priority parks and playgrounds such as repainting, playground equipment, handball courts, sports coating, basketball courts, and replanting garden areas. The target improvements was our way of letting the communities with parks that lacked investment know that we care and we are committed to making immediate improvements while the CPI process runs its course. Equity did not only guide our approach to allocating these resources, it also shaped our design approach to determine which capital projects should be made at these parks. To create our CPI project designs, we listened to the voices that needed to be heard, the local community members and park users that rely on these parks so they can tell us what, how these imagined, reimagined parks could best meet their needs. In the past, public input sessions for park projects were held during the day, resulting in few attendees and leaving most local residents feeling like they weren't included in the conversation. So we moved these sessions to the evening when people could attend and the CPI funds were used so that our Partnership for Parks Outreach Coordinators could actively target community organizations to help get the word out and encourage local park users to attend. We even set up kids' tables, and I have to say they were typically the most exciting and dynamic at these sessions so the younger park users could brainstorm and provide valuable creative input and they demonstrated that they had just as much to contribute to the process as their stodgy adults. I also want to share two stories uh, of what happens at this meeting. Uh, there was one design session uh, in next to Stapleton Playground at PS95 in Staten Island, and there was a man that came up to me who grew up next to this park, and there were tears in his eyes because now he has a child, and he said throughout his entire life he played in this, in this park, this playground, that just was unkept and really unloved. And he looked at me and said, I can't believe that you cared. He thought nobody cared about this community and nobody cared about this park. And I have to say that was an extremely rewarding moment that now uh, he knows that there's gonna be a total transformation and he will be proud to take his children to that park. Another story was one at Lafayette Playground. I remember Council Member Traeger was there and he was shocked by the number of Asian Americans that came out to this meeting in the evening for the first time. But what was interesting is that there were students from the high school for sports management. They were young African Americans. And you can tell they all sat at different tables as you can see here on the slide. And when it became presentation time, uh, the Asian Americans were concerned because they were coming up with their design about how to deal with this public space. The Asian Americans would go there early in the morning and they would uh, have Tai Chi. Uh, and so they were worried as these young men were starting to design what they'd like to see for the park. They were holding their breath, the room was tense. And when the young people said they wanted to have an education area, and then they said they wanted to set out a side of a plaza because they said people in the morning, they uh, go there to do Tai Chi. And it was this beautiful moment where you saw this community connect 
using this public space. It was a special moment as one that I personally will not forget. I am pleased to report that over 2,600 community representatives participated in the community input sessions that inform the CPI project designs. And this is again moving it from afternoon to evening. And this allowing park users, neighborhood leaders, community board members, and elected officials to provide input on the design of the parks and playgrounds funded for renovation. Since the CPI approach has been so successful in engaging local community groups and encouraging participation, we've adopted these practices for all of our capital design community input sessions so more park users can have an opportunity to contribute to shape the future of their parks. Through keeping our parks in the state of good repair as a priority, it's equally important that the park is active and programmed, fully fulfilling its potential with a connected community. Great parks are not simply reconstructed, but they require great care, stewardship, and activation. This is why Mayor de Blasio has dedicated baseline expense funding to staff increased public programming and maintenance as well as community part partner capacity building. Through CPI, we're bringing enhanced programming to parks and playgrounds serving high-need communities, including youth games and sports through our expanded Kids in Motion and summer sports experience. We also have, under our Urban Park Ranger, the natural classroom programs, all of these serving our children throughout the city, as well as our free shape-up classes for adults and mobile libraries and much more. 1.5 young park visitors have ex especially benefited from the expanded new program over the past three years, thanks to the CPI-funded playground associates that we have developed uh, to be deployed to these neighborhoods. And this summer, we'll continue to provide free youth programming throughout the five boroughs. We recognize that parks are brought to life by communities that use them, so to engage the local residents and advocates and champions that surround our parks, CPI, our Partnership for Parks Outreach Coordinators have supported 300 community partners in CPI neighborhoods, providing resources and capacity building training to sustain stewardship efforts. Through the partnership, the City Parks Foundation, uh, who's here with us today, uh, we have engaged nearly 38,000 park volunteers in over 1,200 stewardship projects within CPI neighborhoods. For park cleanup projects and community events, bringing parks to life and cultivating valuable dedicated partners that can help us care for these parks in a sustained and supportive manner. I'm also pleased, of, um, I'm pleased to offer updates about some other park capital initiatives influenced by the framework for an equitable future. Given the needs of a fast growing city, a commitment to equity means we need to continue improving our parks and playgrounds in all neighborhoods, especially those parks acting as anchors to their surrounding communities by providing large, diverse recreational resources. In August of 2016, Mayor de Blasio joined NYC Parks in announcing the Anchor Parks Initiative, an investment of $150 million for major improvements at five parks, one in each borough. Through Anchor Parks, we will invest in new resources like soccer fields, comfort stations, running tracks, and walking paths, transforming these parks for the 750,000 New Yorkers who live in the neighborhoods that surround them and making these older parks feel new again. The five anchor parks, each slated to receive 30 million in major improvements, are St. Mary's Park in the Bronx, Betsy Head in Brooklyn, High Bridge in Manhattan, Astoria in Queens, and Fresh Kills on Staten Island. The five projects are on schedule as the phases of significant work in each park are underway. On the screen, you will see some of the impacts these sites will have, including Astoria Park, and that's the field, and High Bridge Park. That's before and after. Our focus on equity also led us to find ways to maximize the impact and utility of our park properties by focusing on portions of the parks that were being underutilized, namely the entrances, edges, and adjacent park spaces. Parks represents 14% of the city's land area, and streets and sidewalks represents 26%. In other words, 40% of the city is in the public realm. In the past, we failed to maximize the potential of our city on land since the edges and the sidewalks surrounding the park were often an afterthought that rarely considered, true, considered truly part of the park. But in 2015, we launched Parks Without Borders initiative, 
reflecting a new approach to park design with the entire public realm in mind. It focuses on the accessibility and connectivity of sections where the park and the surrounding community interact most directly so we can better activate sidewalks and edges of our parks, make the park entrances more welcoming, and improve sight lines in and out of our parks, connecting them more seamlessly to the surrounding communities that depend on them for recreation and relaxation. In addition to the focus on design, the initiative included $50 million in mayoral funding, 10 million of which was applied toward projects already underway, and 40 million of which were dedicated towards eight showcase projects receiving large scale capital redesigns. Embodying the spirit of fairness and equity, we selected the showcase projects by gathering direct input from New Yorkers who knew these parks best. We received over 6,000 nominations for close to 700 different parks. We could only choose eight. Uh, so roughly one third of our park system spread across all 59 community boards. New York City Parks evaluated the most popular park choices to determine locations that had the most potential to benefit from this new design. Our eight showcase projects with parks at our borders are in the Bronx, Van Cortland and New Grant Circle of Virginia Park, in Queens, Flushing Meadows Corona Park, on Staten Island, Faber Park, in Brooklyn, Fort Greene and Prospect Park, and in Manhattan, Seward Park and Jackie Robinson Park. At this time, all projects have had their designs finalized and approved by the Public Design Commission or Landmarks Preservation Commission. Three are undergoing procurement to identify a construction contractor, and the remaining five will enter procurement this spring. Pending a successful bidding process, we expect all sites to be in construction by early 2019 and completed in 2020. On the screen are some of the most wonderful transformation and renovations. First, this is Flappish Avenue on Prospect Park. It has a very thick edge. Uh, then it's going to be changed to this entrance just south of Grand Army Plaza. We have some other interior shots. Again, you did not have access to the park at this location. This takes you to the Rose Garden and the Long Meadow. This is the kind of transformation to make the parks more accessible and beautify them for the public. Seward Park has a high gate closed off by the edge with a fence around this community garden. It's right next to a library. Now there'll be an open plaza with seating. And now for once, this public asset will be enjoyed by the public. Beyond these mayoral initiatives, equity will continue to be a lens through which we view capital expenditure decisions in hopes of continuing to allocate city capital resources where they're needed most. We'd like to partner with you as you consider making discretionary capital allocations for pro parks projects in the upcoming fiscal year. As you make those allocation decisions, we can help identify projects that prioritize the state of good repair of our district parks, taking historical investment data and other key metrics into account. The spirit of fairness helps us inform, helps us inform uh, how we go beyond the capital improvement process. Equity also means that all New Yorkers have access to quality green space. A major goal of our agency and one NYC plan is to have 85% of all New Yorkers living within a walk to a park by 2030. And we have made major strides since 2014, increasing our park system walk score to 81.5. Through our parks and borders design, we welcome the opportunity to consider new entrances for a park, mm -hmm. which can greatly increase access to nearby residents and otherwise could have a walk to a park around every perimeter of every, to, for the people to enter the park. We've also clarified signage in some of our parks and playgrounds to ensure that senior citizens and other adults have access to parks and amenities like comfort stations and chess tables and benches. Through we do this, uh, though we do designate that in specific children's play areas, an adult has to be accompanied by a child to be present in an area, we're clarifying confusing or conflicting signage at our park on our park rules which previously led senior citizens and other adults to believe they weren't welcome in an entire park property as opposed to just specific children's play area. We also believe that equity means that all of our parks should be kept in the cleanest and best condition possible. So we've standardized our maintenance efforts across the city and improved our management practices to provide a more enjoyable experience for all New Yorkers. For example, we know our parks and playgrounds are being used seven days a week, but in previous years, they were only being cleaned five days per week. 
resulting in overflowing garbage bins and litter strewn throughout the parks come Monday morning. In this administration, we reconfigured staffing patterns to provide additional maintenance on weekends, and the mayor has provided expanding baseline funding for increased seasonal maintenance staffing uh, increases, ensuring that our parks and playgrounds stay clean and welcoming even throughout a busy weekend. I hope I've demonstrated today fairness and equity are guiding principles for this administration and this agency, and this spirit infuses and informs everything we seek to accomplish. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today and for your great advocacy for parks via the work on this committee, and I'll now be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for um, that very broad and uh, informative discussion and testimony. Uh, we've also been joined this morning by Council Member Andy King of the Bronx. Um, I am going to ask a few questions and I'm going to open it up if any of my colleagues, uh, I think two of them so far, have questions. Um, can you describe, and, and we're going back to, going back to the past now, um, the criteria that we use to pick uh, the parks? I know that the, the investment was under a quarter million dollars. Were there other criteria yes. um, based on density and that kind of thing? Yes. So one, we looked at poverty. We looked at density. We looked at potential for growth. We also looked at the amount of investment, which you stated, uh, less than 250000 over 20 years. In addition, we looked at our, our inspection reports, and we did a site visit. So those uh, cumulatively is what we uh, took a look at as we start to uh, determine which parks uh, had met this criteria. So those were all the factors. Okay. Um, initiative is mostly capital money. And um, the question, one of the questions I have this morning, have you inserted a uh, requisite number of expense dollars so that we make sure that these parks are maintained as they come online? Um, we expect, I know when my son was very young, I, I like other people, we shop with our feet. So. Uh, the local park was very nice, um, but the park on 188th Street, about six blocks north of the LIE, was much nicer. Um, so what I am concerned about is that these parks will be, well, we want people to enjoy them, obviously, and uh, the worst problem we should ever have is that too many people are visiting our parks. But I am concerned that the expense dollars are enough to maintain these parks uh, so that people will feel safe and comfortable um, and have a wonderful experience. Yes, we added 21 heads. Uh, there was also uh, a baseline 1.2 million of mayoral funding uh, used for playground associates uh, to host some of our other activities. So the answer is we're looking very carefully to make sure that all of these new parks as well as our entire park system is maintained uh, properly. So we've also shifted our approach to management as I touched on in my testimony. Uh, we've now uh, worked very closely with our commissioners. We now have regional managers and administrators in certain parks so that we can monitor how all of our parks are taken care of. So the answer to your question is yes. We're very mindful of how we're maintaining our CPA parks as well as other parks, but we have 21 new heads on the maintenance side and then 1.2 million baseline funding for the per playground associates within our parks. So that we didn't divert funding from other parks to these parks? You know, no, we did not. We don't want to talk a war here. No. Um, the, the projects as they're moving forward, have, have you noted, um, and I know you've only been commissioner since 2014, um, some people have said anecdotally to us that these projects seem to be moving quicker uh, through, the, through the process, uh, which I know is long and we will be looking at that um, sometime in the near future. But um, do you see, as a, or your staff seen that these projects are moving through the process faster? All projects starting in October 2014 are moving faster. Uh, when we launched this community parks initiative, it was the same time that we went through our streamlined capital process. So starting in 2014, comparing the previous years, all projects starting in the fall of 2014 are moving quicker than they had in the past. So CPI was just is there, a component. Is there a re is, have you been able to identify a reason for that, though? Uh, yes, know? we can have a, a separate hearing. We uh, will. We, I can <laughs> promise you that. <laughs> uh, we were able to shave off about four to six months on a design side and 100 days on a construction side, but that benefited all projects starting the fall of 2014, including uh, the CPI projects. Okay. Um, 
have there been any problems that you've identified? Have there been any notable delays to, to the CPI or the Anchor Park, Parks projects? Well, any delays, and there have been a few, uh, this affects all projects, whether uh, we did not get a responsible bidder uh, or uh, there's a variety of reasons why things would slow down. In some cases, if the bid comes in too high and I refuse to accept it, we have to rebid it. That will be a three or four month delay. In some cases, there was an issue with one of the designs and one of the CPI parks. We had to go back several times. So that is not unusual, but for the most part, a uh, majority of all the projects in both CPI, parks or borders, and anchor parks are, are proceeding generally on schedule. Okay. Um, we had been told that 134 parks were identified as having extreme capital needs um, through your surveys were located in lower income neighborhoods uh, when this initiative was first developed. Yet, uh, at this time, there are only 67 parks identified. Are, are, what's your plan as go forward to bring in those other 67? Well, as you know, we have a budget process every year. This is a I conversation know. we have both with OMB and the mayor. But we're also having conversations, as you probably know, with all the council members. Uh, we know some of the parks uh, that would need an investment, and so we continue to put this first and foremost and share this information with the council member, but it is something that we are certainly advocating for and we will work with OMB as we look at, um, as we go through the budget process. Um, it may be early to ask this question. Have you tracked the uses rate, usage rates for the renovated park um, or had a, a post-construction opening? Are we going to be opening a number of them? I hope to join you uh, for part of that day. It's preliminary budget month uh, starting tomorrow. Um, but I do hope to at least be at one or two of those parks. Um, I may ask you for a ride, but um, <laughs> but right, um, I'm, I'm running to each one. Oh, you're right. running. <laughs> I'll get my roller skates. It was case. a relay. Oh, okay, um, I'll be walking quickly then. Um, have you determined? Has there been a bounce? You know, in the I assume that that you open this park and. You know, people, the word about spread, you got to go to that park because it's so much better than it was or it's better than the park there. And so have you seen an increase in usage? We are, we have seen an increase just by sight, but in terms of counting this summer, we have a usership team that will go out and start to measure the change. We do have a study with CUNY. It'll take some years to see the impact, both health as well as usability of those parks. But we are seeing an increase. Grand Avenue Playground in the Bronx, uh, that one, uh, Cabrera's district, was unbelievable. There were probably the most people I've seen waiting for that park to open. They're actually well, waiting outside for the park? Well, it was, a, it was one of the older designs with a fence and a lock before we okay. actually did the ribbon cutting. Okay. There were over 250 people online waiting for that park to open. And that was a good story there. This is one where, mm -hmm. you know, there was not the best behavior happening uh, at that park. Uh, the nearby uh, public housing project, uh, the one tenant association was overwhelmed in crying because she said, you don't understand, this is where we go for vacation. And I so understand. we, it's a spray shower, it's phenomenal, uh, and it's something that we're seeing across the board. So in that one, it was packed every time we went by. This is a park, I didn't show the images on this, I think we did show one of the spray shower images, uh, that this was a park basically that was unused and that was just totally transformed. So we're seeing it, we're gonna do those numbers this summer to see how well uh, they've improved. Uh, we opened West Laurelton Playground soon after uh, Melinda Katz became the borough president. It was a nice warm day, and I pressed the button, and the spray shower went off, and she looked at me, and she said, you really don't have young children, do you? I said, no, <laughs> I don't. I'm well, used to the concrete. Uh, we're going to be redoing um, Challenge Playground in uh, Little Neck Douglaston, which still has the old concrete. Um, they well built. It's still there. It's probably circa 1950-something. Um, but I'm looking forward to that in my district. I promised myself as a chair that I wouldn't eat up too much time at the beginning, so I'm going to stick to that promise. So, uh, so my colleagues who uh, we have a very busy day, uh, the first one uh, with questions is Moyer. Councilman Mr. Moyer is with us. I want to welcome uh, my colleague from Queens, Francisco Moya. Uh, but first up is uh, Mr. Peter Ku, and I'm going to ask the, them to set the clock. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's five. I'll be different. I'll make it four minutes for the four first Four minutes? Round. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh. Oh. He's on? He's off. Uh, Commissioner. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, there are currently 56 parks included in the City Park Initiative, the CPI. Of those 56, eight are in Queens, which is only 14%. Uh, only one in my district, uh, Bomb Playground, AKA PS20, Q. How is the funding being divided among parts with CPI funding, uh, specifically between the individual parts and how about between the boroughs? Uh, just a clarification, there are 67 uh, community parks initiative parks 18 in the Bronx, 16 in Brooklyn, 16 in Manhattan, 10 in Queens, and seven in Staten Island. Oh, so, so the percentage is even lower for us. Well, we are looking at, as I stated, uh, we focused specifically on parks that met the criteria. And as a result, we identified 134 parks uh, that meet the criteria of poverty, density, growth, and receive less than $250,000 in capital. If the park didn't qualify, it did not, in your district, it did not meet one of those criteria. Uh, but we held to this one, it was a data-driven approach, and so there were 10 in Queens, and I'm aware that you have bound playground in your district. Okay, then I go on my second question, sir. <coughs> First and Meadow Corona Park is one of the biggest park in the city. I think it's bigger than Central Park. However, the parks department seems to have forgotten about its existence when it comes to funding. Uh, at least my side of the park, if you visit the park in the summer and enter through the, my district, you will see dead grass, patches of dirt, broken walkways, if they exist, and no lighting at night. Thousands of people come to use the swimming pool, the recreation center, and the ice skating uh, wing on my side of the park. But often these people, uh, these park goers tell my office that they are scared to go there because it looks abandoned. Uh, what is your plan to address the Flushing side of the park? Well, first, I'm pleased to say that Flushing Mount Corona Park probably has more capital funding than uh, slated for the future than almost any park in our system. Well over $270 million of capital improvements are coming to Flushing Meadow Corona Park. Granted, most of that funding will go into two bridges, Porpus Bridge and the Passerelle Bridge, but there are a lot of investment going on. Uh, and as you know, we have, uh, we're always open to hear from the residents directly. We now have a new alliance that's willing to sit down, and then we have our administrator that's willing to sit down to hear the concerns of the community. But there is a lot of investment going on in Fleshy Meadow Corona Park, and we welcome all input from your residents to find out what can we do to address it. Uh, in terms of the other aspect, uh, we are now deploying uh, more of a zone maintenance program. And so if there's concerns about turf and grass, our crews will go out there. As you know, soccer is very popular and South American volleyball. That tends to do some heavy damage to turfs. We're exploring where synthetic turf would go in to avoid having some of the natural turf that's compacted soil and ends up being dirt. So we're always willing to work with the residents and we extend a meeting with you and whatever stakeholders you want us to sit down with to explain to them how we're investing in all parts of Flushing Meadow Corona Park. Yeah, because it's important you know, on my side of the park, you know, especially you can walk in underneath the, the highway, the bridges, but it's no, there's no sign there to, to say, go to Flushing uh, right. uh, Meadow Corona Park. Yeah, yeah, council member, as you know, you just appointed someone to the Flushing, to, to, to our alliance. Uh, and he was there at the last meeting. We're sharing all our plans. One is going to be a wayfinding system throughout the park. So people know, as you know, this is a park that is divided by many highways. And so we have a wayfinding approach to help people understand what's in the park and how to get into the park. Thank you. So I'll come back for a You'll come back for a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, we now have uh, an, uh, Councilman Cohn from the Bronx. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioner. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I will, you know, think that this is a great initiative. I've followed, uh, I've been, you know, this is my second go around in the park, so I, I followed this through. You know, one thing, though, that was always, it's always been of some concern, and I guess it's still of some concern, is, uh, you know, with the, with the criteria, it, it sort of feels like, you know, in my council district, there's been a history of the council members su really supporting parks, and you know that, uh, you know, I've invested, you know, the vast majority of my capital in, in parks projects. I have a lot of parks and, and I want them to be beautiful and state of the art. 
Uh, but it feels a little bit like, well, you know, maybe maybe the smart thing is to not invest in my parks and we'll wait and, and the parks department will do it and I can put my capital someplace else. So I think in, in the, under the rubric of being fair, it's important, like it would be wrong, I think, if the parks department was not supportive of, uh, of districts where the council member in particular versus mayoral money and maybe that's a, when you look at that, at those figures, uh, it might be worth, you know, as you develop criteria in the future, I think council member support might, you might want to pull that out from, from city, from the administration support uh, in looking at criteria. And, uh, you know, I'm the first to admit that, uh, you know, I'm thrilled that uh, my uh, Parks Without Borders project in Van Cortland Park is, is, you know, that was uh, uh, on you. But, uh, uh, you know, and also in terms of process, uh, uh, you know, I'm very envious that, you know, many of these CPI projects, you know, cutting ribbons, I have projects, you know, many projects where there's no shovel in the ground, never mind uh, a ribbon. But, I, and I will say, just to give her credit, uh, uh, you know, my borough commissioner, I love her. She's extremely communicative. And, and my projects do seem to be sort of, you know, rumbling along. But, uh, but to see all these CPI projects already uh, having ribbon cuttings, I, I'm jealous. So just by way of context, uh, over the past, my first four years, we completed uh, close to 380 capital projects. 14 of those have been CPI. So you can see it's been a small fraction. It does get a lot of attention, but we've been trying to move all the projects, and it is a small percentage of all the par projects we've completed. I hear you on the criteria. Uh, from my perspective, we're not looking to count, uh, punish any council member. We took a look and found out 20 years, multiple mayors, multiple council members, and these parks were forgotten. And when we looked at it, it was very difficult uh, to not walk away from that decision. We had to figure out how to help those parks. And each year, more parks fall into that category, and I'm assuming they may, some of them may be in your district. So we're working very closely to see what we can do. There's a life cycle to a playground. 20 years is far too long uh, for a park to be improved. It was mentioned, these are still Robert Moses era playgrounds. And we are saying 20 years, it could be 30 years that some of these parks hadn't seen investment. So for us, it was a fairness about finally over, they were hiding in plain sight. For 20 years, these playgrounds and parks were forgotten, and we felt that time was up, and we had to focus our attention. So it was not to punish those council members that invested. It was to address multiple administrations that just dropped the ball, and, and, and these parks were hiding in plain sight. Yeah, I don't think that I feel punished. I don't think any of my colleagues feel punished, uh, but we, we sort of want to, I, I think that we want, you know, as a good partner with the Parks Department, uh, we just want to make sure that that's, uh, always remembered also. We hear you when we're sitting down through our new approach toward uh, looking at our capital needs assessment. Uh, we want to do better planning on life cycle side so we know play equipment only has a certain life cycle. Uh, we want to do a better job work with council members so we can keep up with maintenance. But your point is well taken, I understand it, and, and we'll take a look to see how we can, uh, I won't say look at the park equity equation, but also look at how we can start addressing some of the other parks in the park system that hadn't seen investment in, let's say, 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cohn. Uh, Councilmember Andy King. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, uh, for your testimony today. Uh, I am going to stay on the same role as my colleague, Councilmember Cohn, because we share the same borough, and well, we are neighbors. He's the 11th, and I'm the 12th. Um, and when we he talked about equity and fairness, um, and that's what I wanted to know a little about, because there are parts of the city of New York where some put parks and playgrounds are in fluent neighborhoods. And the conservatories, and they call come together and they put their money in. Um, how, I want to know how the park balances that as opposed to a neighborhood that doesn't have, you know, the godfather that's on the side that's able to put a million in and say, let's make sure the Central Park camp or this little park around on 86 in York is taken care of, where St. Mary's Park is struggling because economics just doesn't provide for that type of um, care. So I just want to get an idea of how do you do that? Do you even have to move money around, or do you say, listen, this neighborhood is being taken care of, but let's, let's focus over here? Um, and secondly, I'd like to know how do you pursue when it comes to parks who have historic values in the city of New York? I have a park that's in my district called Seton Falls Park, which, you know, the district that I represent was connected, it's still connected to the state, but it was farmland. So many of those parks, is, it's a lot of greenery, a lot of grass and grapevines and so forth and waterfalls, and they're very pretty, but the maintenance has been so off, you know, as far as, so people use them or they use them for the wrong reason because 
it's not conducive to family life. It's conducive because it's dark, it's desert, no one cut anything down. So the history of a park tends to go down if parks don't say, hey, how do we take a look at the parks and playgrounds that have had a historic value to us? Well, first, uh, I will take a look at that specific park, but is our stand across the board that no park is considered not cared for or maintained. So if that's the case, I'll certainly sit down with the team. I have to un have an understanding of what the public's expectation, but in terms, every single month, I get the park rating about how parks are maintained, large mm -hmm. and small. And uh, if a park does not seem to be doing well, we intervene immediately. So uh, I will see the park that you're referring to if, in fact, there are some issues in that park, we'll rectify that very quickly. In terms of your first question, uh, we do have a number of conservancies that do support their parks. Uh, the, what we do, uh, one, we have a partnership with these conservancies. Uh, they now are part of the Parks and Equity Initiative, and eight of the largest conservancies are helping to support the Community Parks Initiative. Eight have joined together, either through in-kind or direct contribution, are contributing $5 million per year over three years, that was $15 million, to help support the Community Parks Initiative. So they bought onto it, and they understand that there are parks throughout the city that hadn't seen investment in a long time. And even though that three-year commitment ended, some continue mm -hmm. to support the Community Parks Initiative because they recognize this is something in our city that should not have happened. In terms of how decisions are made, there's mayor oral funding, there's council funding, and there's borough president funding. Each of our staff will sit down with the council members to share what are some of the parks in need. We don't take into account how affluent the neighborhood is. We know each council member has a certain allocation, and we share with you underfunded projects, projects in need, so we can, in some cases, partner with you to improve those parks. So we approach everything from a point of equity and fairness, and we don't favor the affluent one community versus another. Our commitment is to have a park system where all parks in all neighborhoods are maintained and cared for properly. And I end with this. Thank you for those answers, and I'm looking forward to, as Cohen said, our commission, Iris Rodriguez, is wonderful. I know at times that she may struggle with the money to get a project done. Um, other than me seeing what's happening in Van Carlin Park, I don't ever see in the North Bronx parks that get, you know, the big flavor and favor. And I'm just, I'm just calling for what it is. So I'm asking as we move forward working together that moving forward the path Fordham Road that we get the same kind of consideration, support, and help that we doesn't always rely on the council member to try to find an extra dollar, an extra million to deliver on parks in our neighborhood. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman King. Uh, Councilman Moyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I just want to say that uh, since we met, and uh, I told my mother about <laughs> the, uh, the tree map. The, yes, <laughs> I can't get her off the computer. Okay. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, but I just wanted to go back to a couple of things that, that some of my colleagues had brought up, and some of the things we talked about. Is it um, you had mentioned that you had looked at projects um, before your tenure and and after? Um, since you've become commissioner, uh, and that you were saying that you were getting them back on track. Um, Correct. But what about the rest of the, those projects that are still pending? Um, what's the status of those? And are those updates delivered to the council members uh, to see if they can help move that along? Um, and also to help us answer questions that we get from constituents in our communities? Yes, one, uh, we have a tracker, so at any given time, any member of the public council member can go on our capital tracker to look at the status. There's roughly about 110 left on the list of delayed projects before my tenure. 70 of that 110 are in construction. So the good news is a majority within the next year or 15 months will now be completed and off the list. The remaining 40, uh, about 31, are in procurement, and about nine are still in design. Uh, these are problematic projects that have been around some dating back eight, nine years. We share the information uh, with the council members, and we're making a determination what to do for some of these projects, and the issues with them are quite severe. We'll certainly sit down with the council member, decide how do we proceed, uh, but the good news is uh, the vast majority are now will be constructed and completed very soon. The procurement projects will be moving into construction, and then there's a chronic nine that are extremely problematic, and I'm trying to figure out what we can do to either just end those projects or how do we proceed with them, but they have just been chronically delayed for quite some time. 
The other uh, question I have is, uh, what's the process for repurposing elements uh, of a park that are unused, such as handball courts, et cetera, like in certain parts of um, my district where um, handball courts are no longer uh, in use anymore? What is that process um, that you guys uh, go about looking at? We have public input sessions, and that is a conversation we have with the community. Uh, there's also some advocates out there. There's a woman who is part of the Wall Ball Association, and she hears of a handball court coming down. You may hear from her. But in <laughs> general, uh, we have that conversation at the community meeting to find out uh, what is their plan. In some cases, it's taking down a few handball courts, leaving up one. Uh, but that is just a conversation we have with the, with the community. Okay. And, and, and lastly, what exactly uh, inflates the cost so much for parks projects, and can you sort of walk us through the labor costs, uh, et cetera? I don't have the specific labor or material cost. I understand there'll be a future hearing. We're more than willing to sit down. Uh, again, we have a very hot market here uh, in New York, and we're seeing prices increase dramatically. It's not just parks. It's all projects across the board. Uh, all I can say is what we're doing is we're standardizing all of our designs uh, so that now we can compare project to project. We're not doing anything that's customized uh, so that it's easy to maintain and design and build. Uh, but we'll certainly welcome to sit down with you to show you over time how those costs are increasing. Uh, we're frustrated as much as all of you. We'd love to build more comfort station rather than just build in. I'd rather build two uh, for four million versus just one. And I'm not saying they're, they're four million dollars but we'll certainly sit down and have a conversation about how we can take a hard look at what we can do about the cost of construction. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilman Moya. Uh, we've been joined by Councilman Brannon uh, from the Great Borough of Brooklyn. Uh, Councilman. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, how are you? I'm fine. It's great meeting with you and agreeing that uh, yeah. a bathroom in a park shouldn't cost $4 million to build. Appreciate we're on the same page there. Um, I wanted to ask, um, to get a little parochial, about Calvert Vaux Park. 2009, Bloomberg promised $40 million. It's a regional park. And to this day, it's not uh, not done. What are, we, what are we doing there? I do know that we're putting in a comfort station that uh, I believe is starting construction very soon. We had to resolve a utility extension. Uh, so that will be a great asset uh, to that park. Uh, I do not believe there's additional funding. I'll have to get back to you about what happened with the prior commitment. I don't have an answer now, but my staff will get back to you. I do know it's come up a number of times. There currently is no funding to complete the other portion of Calvert Vox. What is there now, as you probably know, is probably one of the best soccer fields in Brooklyn. And now having that comfort station there uh, would equally make that a great destination for that park. But I'll have to get back to you about exactly what happened with uh, I know that was a Bloomberg uh, recommendation. Don't know what happened from that administration uh, to see what happened with that funding. We'll get back to you. Okay, appreciate that. Boy, well, you're quick. Um, thank you, Councilman. Uh, for a second round, uh, Councilman Koo. <laughs> he believes in equity, so. <laughs> so, Commissioner, so. You know, in my district, uh, we, we are very like, condensed. We have uh, lots of uh, pedestrians. We have, uh, it's one of the most busy places in the whole New York City, you know? So we have a place called Blank Playground on 44 and Penn Street. And I think it needs to be considered for City Park Initiative or the Anchor Park Initiative, you know? My uh, staff has a four-year-old daughter and my office is only like one block away from that uh, playground. And she, she refused to go to that playground because she tells her, that, oh, this is the dirty part, you know? And, and, and I hear the same thing from uh, a lot of families. Uh, and this is the most inconvenient, uh, the most convenient part in downtown Flushing. And it's the one, a lot of apartments, you know, so he said that nobody wants to go there. So I hope uh, uh, you can take a look uh, on this uh, because last year uh, I put in $500,000 
of my uh, allocation uh, to renovate the park. So I hope we can work together to make sure the park uh, get renovated because it's right in downtown Flushing. It creates a really bad image uh, uh, for city because we cannot even manage a, a, a small playground. Uh, with, well, uh, it, it is in within the zone. We'll just take a look at it yeah. and we'll get back to you. And then, and then another question is, uh, uh, when I go to the parks, the most people ask me is, the bathroom is terrible, you know, no matter which park we go. So sometimes they're closed, sometimes they have no bathrooms. So I hope in the future, uh, we put this as a priority in uh, uh, conversation in parks. Because we are human beings, so what goes in has to come out. You know? <laughs> yeah. I've heard that. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, especially for senior citizens, you know? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rest assured. So I hope you, because, and then I don't know when, I understand. If you have specific ones, it, we also have, we inspect our parks. We conduct, I'm guessing, like 6,000 inspections throughout our park system every year. We do inspect comfort stations, and so we get reports on those that pass and fail. Uh, so it is our commitment to make sure that people have a wonderful experience, even in our comfort stations, that they are clean, that they are well-serviced with the proper uh, toilet, uh, the uh, paper, uh, hand towels, et cetera. But if you have a specific park, we'll take a look at it because uh, our goal is to make sure that every park is and comfort station is a pleasure to go in. Because if you go to the like Maple Playground, the bathroom is closed all the time, and, and Casino Park Playground is closed all the time. No, it's not for our residents, to, they have no place to go. We'll check into that one. Uh, if it's closed, that means for certain times, times of the year, it's going to be closed. But if it's closed permanently, that means that something may be happening with a comfort station. We'll also check on that comfort station. You said Casino Playground? Okay. Yeah. So can, can in the future, can you, like, when you build bathrooms, can you, like, consult uh, the local office? Uh, because sometimes you build a bathroom is which is not functional, you know? No. All of our conversations are standardized right yeah. now. There's a newer design. Because you have to take exceptions. Because right. usually a bathroom only have a male, the like, urinal. Okay. It's not enough. You should have a, a, a long urinal. No. no. Yes, council five, six people can to do it, uh, you and it together, okay. you know? We're trying to keep the cost down. <laughs> it just, it just I mean, I don't want to do, do it in details in the public hearing, but this is something we have to change, you know? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Koo, for illuminating us on that. <laughs> we may do, we may do a, uh, a hearing on comfort stations, but not today. Um, thank you for your uh, questions. Uh, Councilman Andrew Cohn for a second round. Uh, I think I'm covering ground. I, I'm just I'm sure I got the answer. There, there is going to be a second round of CPI? There were two phases of CPI. The first was 35 parks. The second was 32 parks. We are now, again, in the capital budget process, so we're having those conversations with OMB. There are multiple needs, but for now, there is uh, no announced next phase of, of CPI at this time. So you made a request to OMB and we're, we're it's in, in sort of... It is an ongoing request. Every year we have more parks that move into the 20-year phase. Uh, I can't say what is happening right now with the budget process. It will be, as you know, it will be released. Either uh, can I. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but certainly there's a desire that as the budget process starts, that's an ongoing conversation about the program and whether it will continue. How many, I, and I, I think you also said this too, but I just one more time, how many parks do you think are eligible currently? Well, the initial round was 134. Every year, maybe eight to 10 parks roll into that 20 year older. It varies because they were all built at the same time. But on average, you'll have anywhere from about eight to maybe 10 parks that falls into that 20 so year So maybe older. 75 parks, uh, you have a menu of about 75 parks that would well, be. Well, that's parks in general. In terms of in the CPI zones, we'll have to see how many. But looking at our entire portfolio, there's about a thousand playgrounds throughout the city, and so that would be that would meet the CPI criteria. No, no, no. no, no. I was I'm saying, saying that 75 general, might meet globally. Meet there are a thousand playgrounds, and some of these playgrounds are within parks themselves. Uh, but on average, we're seeing about eight to ten that reach that 20-year threshold. But in, in the eligibility for CPI right now, you're thinking is there are about 75 parks that would meet the criteria? I'd have to get back to you on the exact number. I know we started with 134. And we're we doing 67. 67 so. A few others and have we added have, yeah. to that list. So in we that can get back to you, yeah, I would say in that neighborhood. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. 
We've been joined by um, Costa Costantanidis, um, and since he's chair of uh, oversees the Environmental Protection Department, uh, I wanted to ask you this question. Um, since DEP is involved in, in the process, um, what environmentally sustainable features are being contemplated for the parks that are have been or are going to be uh, redesigned under CPI? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's a significant number. Uh, we are working with DEP to do stormwater uh, retention in those parks. Uh, I'm guessing it's almost all. Do we know the? Yes, that's uh, 29. 29 of the 35 uh, have a DEP green infrastructure element within the park. So that's extra funding for those parks. Uh, so that's something we certainly enjoy, that partnership, and we look to that. Do you get money from DEP? Yes. Yeah. Even better. Even better. And to also emphasize, these parks were also done in the new expedited timeline, working with DEP and incorporating their green <coughs> infrastructure design with our design. So this is showing how not only is the partnership working, but the new streamlined capital process is working as well, even though you're adding another agency on board. Okay. Uh, we'll now hear for the second round from Councilman King and then uh, uh, Councilman Costantinides. So, Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. Again, um, my two questions for you this round um, goes back to the criteria um, of the CPI. So I want to know if a park does not meet any of the 12, 22 criteria, but is still in need, is there a plan still to address it, address those, those parks or playgrounds? And secondly, when you do um, have your quote and you're about to build a park, and we know we've all experienced that, in a minute this time, you're telling us it is 2.6 million in 2018, January, and but by May, it is 3.9 million. So what is your response? How, do you, how have you dealt with this? Um, do you, do you, does the council come in, or do you just say no to this developer, or do you just add the money? What's, how do you handle that? It depends. It varies across the board. Uh, we do our best at estimating. Uh, in fact, we even include more in the estimate, and then we put out to bid now that the contract is responding, the number is higher than we expected. This is not just a problem for parks. This is across the board for all agencies. And I know there'll be a, a hearing to discuss exactly what is happening on the industry side. In terms of parks in need, uh, we look at all strategies. Uh, clearly, we reach out to the borough president. We reach out to the council members. Uh, we have stated good repair that we focus on. We use in-house resources if we can do it that way. So I'm looking at a variety of ways, because we have close to 2,000 parks, 1,000 playgrounds, that I'm looking at every single strategy that we can use. We've used in-house staff to repair a comfort station. Uh, we now have a speci specialized turf team that cleans our turf. I'm trying to be as innovative and creative with what we have, and that will continue going forward. So in your district, you'll soon meet out some of our, uh, if you haven't already, with uh, Commissioner Rodriguez Rosa, to show some of the parks in your community that we see are in most need. And then we'll figure out how you can help, whether there's possible mayoral dollars, or we can use some of our innovative approaches within parks to address some of those issues. So it's, I put everything on the table to figure out what we can do, because I do agree there are parks that are in need. And we want to figure out, uh, council district by council district, what we can do to improve those park spaces. Uh, and then let me just wrap up. i got a minute 38. Any of those vendors who come back with a large number that's not within your budget, have you ever figured out how not to do business with them, to hold them accountable because they mess up your timeline? Well, what we do, uh, we want to make sure we have good relationships. We want our contractors to be successful. We want our MWBEs to be successful. So we work with our contractors to make sure they reach success. We have reg engineer, resident engineers to help them move through the process. If a bid is too high when it's submitted, I have two choices, accept this high bid for a comfort station or reject it and wait another three or four months to rebid it out again. So in one case, people may get upset about the high price, but if I reject it, people get upset that the timeline is a lot longer. So it's a bit of a catch-22. We talk to them and examine why is this coming in so high, and we have a, a Deputy Commissioner Braddock from our capital team analyzes this, and so we only will default someone, and that is a rare case, if they're just not doing the job well. It's rare that we do that. We try to work with the contractor, keep them on schedule to make sure they produce a quality project. 
Thank you, and, and Mr. Chair, I'll end with this. Um, I'm drafting legislation to come before you, and I'm, I'm urging us, and I had the conversation with the commissioner, to make sure that if a bid comes in at this number, that they can't boost up the number six months down the road. And I think once we start sending a message to the people who are out there who are just, because right now they're, they're, they're dictating the prices of everything. So if the city says, we're only going to pay $5 million for this project, and if Joe wants to do the project for $5 million because you came in at $6 million, you're going to stop, stop losing contracts because everyone is setting the too, bar too high for us right now so they can get paid as opposed to if they can do it at $5 million in May, then they can do it at $5 million in November. And if we start take, taking a new approach, then, may, then they will get them forced down to bring the numbers down. And then we get projects done within two years instead of eight years. This has been the going rate around here. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman King. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at the hearing where we examine the capital construction process. Uh, Councilman Costantinidis. Thank you, Chairman Gudenchik, and I am so glad to say the words. Chairman Gudenchik, congratulations <laughs> on your first hearing, sir. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then, Commissioner, it's always great to see you. I have a few questions. So, uh, talking about uh, CPR parks uh, out in Western Queens, uh, is there a timeline uh, relations to uh, Astoria Health? Astoria Health is a procurement, 85% complete is scheduled to be completed procurement in April, which means it will start construction this year. So we're talking about groundbreaking sometime later on this year? Yes. That's great to hear. <laughs> And then the, uh, I know that we just recently had um, I, I, you know, uh, Chepetto Square, what, you know, I, what we affectionately call in Astoria the cheese box. Uh, I know that's on the, uh, gotta use the Astoria lingo, you know? <laughs> uh, the, the, the cheese box in Astoria, that's just went into scoping. Correct. That should be, we should be seeing a design soon? Yes. Okay. Did we have a public session yet? We had a public session. All right, so you'll see the conceptual design very soon. Uh, we had, I know we had it in, Late October, early November, that the months are all trying to you know blend into one another at this point. But I know, but soon we'll see that particular yeah. design. I think we should buy our discount. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. Uh, it, in terms of the whole design process, that schedule will be completed in October. You'll we'll see the concept before then. Then it goes to PDC before it gets finalized. But you will see the conceptual design very soon. And as far as the uh, Anchor Park program. Uh, I know that Astoria Park was very excited to get um, those dollars. I think that's, oh, geez, I'm, leading, I'm the one leading on the lights. Uh, the, we're looking at phase one to begin this year in yes. construction. Correct. And then that'll be done by 2019. No, 20, 2020, 2019. Hold on a second. Astoria uh, Park, we'll say 2020. Yeah. 2020 will be completed. So the phase one will be completed 2020. Correct. On phase two, when are we looking at construction, uh, procurement? That should be followed about a year, 2021. So 2021. Right. Okay. So we'll have procurement sometime this year. Correct. Correct. All right. And then lastly, looking at just sort of conceptually, right? So I'm, I'm asking very specific questions about Astoria. But I think there are other larger questions about how we then fund, um, outside of anchor parks, these large entities that are, you know, like the, I'll use the example of my story, the Astoria pool that are a huge construction project that is beyond the scope of a any, you know, one city council member, one borough president, uh, you know, you're talking in the neighborhood of 40, 50 million dollars. How do we work together to conceptualize a, a way forward there? As I stated earlier, this is all part of the budget process. Uh, working with both the mayor's office and OMB as we go through, we'll hear some of the needs, and then as we go through the process, we'll determine what are some of the priorities. Uh, so I hear you. Uh, we certainly understand what some of the needs are out there, uh, but it is, again, part of the capital budget process that <coughs> will, which is basically, uh, we'll have our hearing on March 27th to start to begin that conversation about some of the needs expressed throughout the, the city and from the council members. Because there, I mean, there are, there, you know, there, there are different needs, right? We have a playground that's three million, that's easier to put that puzzle together than it is the larger part. And I think having the discussion about how we citywide look at these larger entities and say how do we at least begin the conversations on these large projects I think is important as well. At least if you know where the end is, you know how to build a, a road to it. Yes. All right, great. Thank you, Commissioner. 
Thank you, Councilman Constantinides. I know it is possible to do it because we're doing uh, the bridge over the LIRR that leads from the 7 train into Flushing Meadow Park. And I was, it's a long time ago, I found the original maps at Borough Hall. Um, and Parks Department was hoping that it said MTA on the map, but unfortunately it said uh, Parks Department. Um, I think it was done under Commissioner Moses the last time. So we look forward to that um, being completed. Um, Councilman Deutsch has joined us. He will have questions for you, but um, just a couple more from me. Um, conservancies have grown tremendously uh, over the last few years in the city of New York, and uh, we welcome them. Um, I wanted to know uh, what role, if any, they are playing in this initiatives, these initiatives. Um, and is the administration planning to involve them in contributing some of their resources to lesser finance parks? And if so, um, will the resource contribution be focused only on parks co co covered under the initiative or will parks outside of the initiative zones also be considered? And I know to answer that your last <coughs> question, the answer is all parks will be considered. Uh, Central Park has a relationship with the Star uh, historic Harlem Parks that are not part of the CPI. Uh, they have their institute program that's helping parks throughout the city outside of the Community Parks Initiative. So the answer is yes, and the same goes for the other conservancies. As I stated, there was a commitment of $15 million through 2018. It was $5 million per year. I'll just summarize some of the, the contributions from each one of the parks. Bryant Park Corporation uh, that runs Bryant Park. They contributed revenue from the carousel and merchandise sales for 2014 and 2015, which supported the community CPI outreach team comprised of AmeriCorps members. They also contributed 250000 toward a five-year study in CPI zones being conducted by CUNY and the uh, New York City Parks, which I mentioned, uh, to look at health outcomes of residents who undergo park improvements. Central Park Conservancy, uh, they completed 35 turf renovation projects in 15 different sites and trained 160 park employees in turf, turf management and techniques. Uh, and uh, in terms of Friends of the High Line, uh, they have been supportive uh, of their Green Council, recruited 43% of their teens from the CPI communities. Uh, and Madison Square uh, helped secure a $100,000 donation to help Von King Park, New York Restoration Project, plant 163 trees in Cretona Park. Prospect Park Alliance helped with the design of various CPA parks, Stroud and Epiphany, and Penn Triangle. Reynolds Island is helping on the East Holland Waterfront Project. The Battery Park Conservancy is helping our green thumb. So throughout, all of these, through either in-kind or cash contributions, support the Community Parks Initiative. Some, even though that commitment ended uh, this year, continue their relationship with these parks, as well as other parks outside of the Community Parks Initiative uh, zones. Um, barriers or removal of barriers um, among parks. Uh, it's been said that that will actually improve park safety, and I appreciate that. And parks can be um, lonely places at times. I have um, two very large parks in my district, Cunningham Park, which is totally in my district, uh, which is about 358 acres, and Alley Pond Park, which is about 660 acres, which I share with Councilman Vallone. Um, you can get lost in there really easily. Um, they're big parks, um, tremendous stretches of forever wild. Um, when, when you start to look at taking down the barriers to uh, entrance and e to the parks, uh, was the NYPD consulted? Yes, they were. Uh, before we even considered putting this into the one NYC, we sat down with NYPD. Fortunately, there's something called SEPTAP. It is crime prevention through environmental design. They actually had experts within NYPD that was familiar with the approach, as well as we had on our staff. Uh, we went through uh, the principles with them. They supported it. We had to get their support before it was included in one NYC, and they fully supported and embraced uh, the whole approach toward parks and borders, which is a part of what we call SEPTEP. All right, you're not going to quiz me on that, are you? <laughs> it's crime prevention through environmental design. It took me a while. Sometimes I get it mixed up myself. All right, and to follow up on that, will removal of certain park barriers make it more difficult uh, to enforce certain park rules, such as, um, for instance, opening and closing times? Well, this is not removal of fences or barriers citywide. Uh, the program, no, which was that. $50 million, 
pet showcase and then pipeline projects, but we have conversations with the community. Certain fences are needed for sports, dog runs, children play areas, steep slopes. You need to have those uh, security measures to keep the public safe. But in other areas, they certainly can come down, uh, but it has no impact uh, on uh, forcing our park rules. Uh, someone can very easily, if there's a fence, traverse a fence, but people are not permitted <laughs> in our parks at certain hours after it closes, whether there is a fence or not a fence, and both NYPD as well as parks, if they're available, will enforce those park rules. Okay. Uh, at this time, um, I am going to ask Councilman Deutsch if he, uh, if he does. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. By the way, I just want you to know, uh, Commissioner, that you have the funniest chairperson in the City Council very chairing the Parks Committee. <laughs> I, I spent a, a week in Israel with uh, Councilmember Grudenchik, and I did not eat for a week. I was laughing all week. And he's really funny, so. I hope um, he brings that humor to the next hearing about the budget. I certainly appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to, you have to watch when he gets serious. Okay. Um, so um, now when someone uh, wants to get, you know, the tree pruned, so the procedure is either to call 311, to call your local elected official, to call the community board, uh, and then hopefully it gets done um, sometime within the next few years. But, and if, an individual homeowner wants to prune a city-owned tree in front of uh, his or her home, then there is a way to fill out a permit, an application, that the city would, uh, would allow the homeowner to get a licensed um, gardener or contractor to, to prune the, uh, that tree. Um, now, if someone is building a, a house, um, and there is a tree like in the way after they follow the building department permits and they want to relocate that tree, then there's uh, under certain circumstances, the city would allow that property owner to relocate, not kill the tree, not cut the tree, but to relocate that tree. Can you first explain to me under what circumstances you would grant permission and what circumstances you would not allow? I don't think we have a team from forestry here. I'll have to get back to you on the relocation. That is, uh, it's concerning. I'm not sure how successful a relocation of a tree can be. I'm not sure in terms of the root system whether that tree can in fact survive. But I'd rather get one of our foresters to respond to your office directly on the specific rules about relocating a tree from one location to the other. Okay, so, so there are specific rules when it could be done. Um, I'm not sure about relocating a tree because um, it, uh, it is. Matt? Yeah. Maybe you have an answer? Uh, generally speaking, and again, our, I think our forestry team can get back to here, but relocation of a tree is, is generally not really uh, feasible for, for, the, for, the, for the tree's life. So I think if, you know, there are other instances, you, you mentioned our plan review process where we work with DOB <laughs> to review a homeowner's, you know, proposed plan, building a new driveway, something like that. And if it is, there is going to be a tree impact that tree will have to be removed, which generally speaking, to my knowledge, generally means you know, the end of the life of that tree. So according to your knowledge was in your time working in the Parks Department, do you know of any time that a tree was granted to, relo to be relocated? Well, I'm not aware of an instance. We'll double check with our forestry team. I'm not aware of the actual relocation of the tree. There, we talk about tree replacement, which is, you know, in essence, uh, a homeowner, you know, if a tree has to be removed or it's un uh, if it's unavoidable under circumstance, uh, under certain circumstances, it'll be approved by the agency. But there's what we call a tree replacement or restitution program. Plus, like I, I'm, the reason why I'm pausing is I've, in my practice, uh, when I was a consultant, you know, I've I've seen trees, historic champion trees, and the cost of the tree to relocate it because it's champion tree. I mean, you're talking about some cases half a million, so. We need to find out, one, if we allow it, two, the likelihood of a tree being relocated. M my guess is probably not, but we want to check with our foresters about literally relocating a tree uh, to another location, unless it's just a, a sapling that was planted and it's like a year old. In terms of a larger tree, to remove that, you have to take the entire ball of the root system, and that could be quite extensive. All right, thank you. Um, okay, now I'd like to talk about tree replacement. You got six seconds. No, you got to give me a... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So uh, now I'd like to talk about tree replacement. So if someone wants to replace that tree um, after um, filing building department permits, what's the procedure on that? You have less than three seconds. Can I need three seconds? There's a question. standard formula that we use. We can share that formula with you as well, but there's a formula they have to use depending on the caliber species that it has to be uh, replaced. So and according to your knowledge, does the city issue those permits to for tree replacement? Yes. Yes. What is the cost of that approximately? It depends on the there's an assessment. It's various factors. But we our staff can sit down and go over that. Approximately. One thousand dollars, two thousand, is it more than ten thousand? I do not know Matt? the number off. Yeah, if I may, Matt sir, it's, uh, it co it's completely dependent on the size and caliper, which is the width of the tree, and the equivalent number of new trees that it will take to essentially replace that tree's impact, especially over the course of time. Okay, so um, I had a um, someone reach out to my office that uh, it was a non for profit. Matter of fact, it's a house of worship that they need to have a tree uh, replaced because uh, it's in the way of the expansion. And the cost that they were given was $50,000, $50,000. Is that possible, $50,000? It is possible. So if you have a program um, where you allow for people to take out a permit to, to prune the tree, why can't you allow them to replace that tree at the owner's cost and not charging that $50,000 because for someone to replace a tree is not going to be nearly the amount of $50,000, maybe a few thousand dollars. There's restitution involved in that, but again, we'll sit down with you to go over the schedule because tree replacement and restitution is not just a one for one. The tree has a value that could have multiple trees to replace that one tree depending on the caliper, the age, the species. So there's not just a quick answer tree for tree. And we'll certainly sit down with you and have a forester explain it to you because it's not, it's, it is complicated. Uh, well, would, can you just give me like a brief description of what the restitution is? They make a determination about the value of that tree that is being taken down. And once there's a whole chart that we use the national standards to determine what is the value of that tree and then that determines how many trees or the cost of that tree is given a value. It ranges across the board. So how much how much could it cost to like take down a tree? Be hundred thousand dollars. hundred thousand. If you have a new a tree that's maybe three years old. No, oh, three so years old would be much less. Would be much less. Right. So is that the price you're charging that that? No, the price is that there's a whole standard. We can share with you the standards so you can see it. It's species, it's age, it's size, it's condition. And each one of those has a monetary value. It is calculated, and that's how staff determines what is the tree restitution value for that tree. So is the charge only for the removal of the tree and no. replacement? No, it's, it's the value of the tree that's being taken away. Uh, so what's, what's the value defined? The amber. The amber. Size, species, age. Uh, it, it is all the factors. There's a whole list. Do you determine how you calculate the value of that tree? Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Deutsch. Last question, Commissioner. Um, certain parks undergoing uh, work pursuant to the Community Parks Initiative are also being targeted for renovations according to the uh, Parks Without Borders guideline. Um, has there been a difference in that, uh, in, in moving them forward, or like a combination, just like? Okay, repeat, repeat the question again, sorry. Certain parks undergoing work pursuant to the Community Parks Initiative are also being targeted for renovations according to Parks Without Border guidelines. So oh, yes. I'm yes. sorry if I wasn't clear yes, the yes. first time. So uh, how many parks are undergoing this work, uh, A, and number two, um, what types of renovations? In terms of Parks Without Borders is, is now part of the agency's design philosophy. We take a look at the fence and the sidewalk adjacent to the park. So it's not just applying to CPI or anchor parks, it's applying to all of the 540 park projects that where it is appropriate. We <coughs> have the conversation with the community about lowering the fence, uh, making the sidewalk more appealing, the outer park, so to speak. 
So it's hard to quantify because now it's just part of our overall design philosophy. Is it going to make things more expensive? I hate to ask that question, but I have to. Uh, I wouldn't say would necessarily. Uh, if it was not, if it is a budget issue, we discuss that. But I do not think, um, in terms of improving the sidewalk, that I'm sure there's some additional cost associated with it, but I don't think it's substantial. It's nominal. Okay. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for being here this morning, Mr. Jury, uh, your staff. We'll now be hearing from uh, members of the public, and I would ask, as we always do, if you could leave some people behind to listen uh, for, from uh, the advocates and uh, for New Yorkers um, who love their parks. Um, the first panel, um, we're going to ask you to limit your testimony to three minutes because I do have to surrender this conference room at 1 o'clock, but I have uh, no doubt that we'll be able to hear from everybody who's signed up. Um, Lynn Kelly, New Yorkers for Parks. Heather Lubov from uh, City Parks Foundation. And Everett Hamlet uh, from Leave It Better. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to ask that the uh, committee council swear you. Oh, we don't swear them? Okay, I'm new at this, so excuse me. Um, good morning, Ms. Kelly. Please begin. Good morning. Congratulations uh, Thank on you your very appointment. Much. We think this is the most important council. I couldn't committee. agree with you more. Wonderful. And uh, thank you for allowing me the time to speak today. My name is Lynn Kelly. I'm the executive director of New Yorkers for Parks. We are the citywide independent advocacy organization for parks and open space in New York. Um, we've been here in the past previously to testify in support of CPI and Anchor Park initiatives. And we're actually pleased that the committee is going to convene another meeting to talk about the capital process in particular. We share some of the frustration uh, that the committee and New Yorkers do about the length of time on the capital process. But we do note the improvements that the Parks Department has made to speed up the process. One particular improvement was the implementation of the capital tracker tool, mm -hmm. but we would add more specifically on this that we'd love to see it prominently displayed on the home page of NYC Parks so that there is more transparency for the public to really understand what is happening. Additionally, another concern we have with a key aspect of CPI and Anchor Parks um, is that as you well mentioned, there are smaller parks that are in the pipeline or in the backlog of the Parks Department for much needed improvements that haven't been able to receive the type of uh, big infusement of capital funding. And that's something that we think is important. But what's more important is that there is a comparable maintenance allocation for not just the capital investment, but for these smaller parks throughout New York City, or the investment that we're making as a taxpayer is frankly moot. We need to see a more robust uh, maintenance budget for the Parks Department in order to meet the capital need. Um, lastly, I would like to say that while I'm delighted to be here in front of all of you. I am saddened to see that your committee does not have one single female uh, representative. No, no. And I would like to work with you. You've shared that with me, yes. and I appreciate it. I've shared that with um, because the twenty-five speaker. of the largest parks in New York City advocacy organizations and capital project organizations are all run by women. And I think if you look in this room, can every lady raise their hand? I it's the majority them. of the audience. So I would hope that we could work together sincerely to convince Speaker Johnson why it's so important that your committee represents 50% of the users of parks in New York City and more than the majority of the management and caretakers I, in I this I can great assure city. you that um, we will take, I, I take my job very seriously. I know the members of the committee do as well. Uh, I wish it was more diverse in the sense of uh, men and women, but that will not detract us at all from what we have to do. Thank you. Okay. Are you done? Or yes. Okay. <laughs> you got 20 more seconds. All right. Uh, Ms. Lubov? I promise. Always keep it on okay. time. And thank you. And I, I think that's an excellent suggestion um, on the park tracker because uh, a lot of people may not be aware of it. Um, and, you know, if you don't go to the f beyond the front page, you, you don't see it. It's like the, the, the cover of a newspaper. Ms. Lubov? Good morning. Thank Good morning. you, Chair Kredenchik and members of the Parks Committee. I'm Heather Lubov. I'm the Executive Director of City Parks Foundation. We're a private nonprofit organization that uses performing arts, sports, environmental education, and community building programs to bring people into parks. 
We believe that thriving parks play an essential role in creating vibrant and healthy communities. Complementary to uh, New York City Parks Community Parks Initiative, we work in more than 350 parks around the city, and our site selection also reflects an emphasis on building equity across the city. We focus our programs, be it a free puppet mobile performance or a summer soccer class for kids in parks that are under-resourced and prioritized by NYC Parks. We are a proud partner with NYC Parks on Partnerships for Parks, which you heard about a little earlier, our jointly managed program that supports a growing network of leaders who care and advocate for neighborhood parks. As a private nonprofit, we bring a different perspective to the table and can play a key role in the Community Parks Initiative, the Anchor Parks Initiative, and Parks Without Borders. We're proud to report that we're directly addressing this administration's strong focus on equity, thanks in large measure to the Council's Parks Equity Initiative. Partnerships is charged with bringing neighbors together for scoping and visioning sessions that provide input for upcoming renovations. After those scope meetings, Partnerships engages interested neighborhoods, uh, uh, and that goes to Councilmember King's question about those without conservancies, uh, to create sustainable park groups, helping them to plan It's My Park service projects and connecting volunteers to skill building workshops. Partnerships now actively supports more than 65 groups in CPI and Anchor Park sites. Long term, partnerships helps groups stay focused and active by connecting them to additional resources, including small capacity building grants, mentorship opportunities, and a larger citywide network of volunteers. Throughout the city, Partnerships for Parks is supporting more than 600 volunteer park groups, including 300 groups in CPI-targeted neighborhoods. Since the launch of CPI and Anchor Parks, we have distributed nearly 140 small grants and engaged nearly 38,000 volunteers through 1,200 It's My Park service projects that help beautify and improve parks in CPI-targeted neighborhoods. Partnerships for Parks helps groups realize their own visions for their communities. And most important for all of you to know today, the vast majority of our technical assistance resources are available because of funding from the Council's Parks Equity Initiative. So we, uh, we owe you an enormous thank you to you and the Council for making that work possible. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, and we look forward to uh, continuing to fund that initiative, of course. And uh, I want to thank both of you for uh, meeting with me and sharing your expertise, and I look forward to working uh, with you and everybody in this room as we go forward. Um, Everett Hamlet, you have a show for us. Yes, I have a, a trailer. I'm doing a film on one of the 67 parks that are being reconstructed, and I'm going to pull that up on screen for you guys okay. right now. Is it possible for me to put it up on the laptop? It's okay with me. I thought it was, was it set already? Oh, I tried it. Okay. okay. Is it audio? It's going on. I'm chair of parks, not chair of technology. <laughs> Bronx. Why are these parks being neglected? No community should be saddled with more environmental burdens and less environmental benefits than any other. We don't other. want to neglect parks in communities of color. Are these just neighborhoods that are gentrified? Many of these are nothing more than blacktop, just asphalt. Not, not too many places in the world that would call that a park. My park, this is our home, you know. That's me standing right in front of Public School 75. And that's me acting goofy in front of my house. I lived in this neighborhood my whole life and I consider every inch of it my home. My name is Ever Hamlet and I'm a young documentarian from the Bronx. I'm making this documentary on a New York City park named Lions Square Playground for my friends and I called the 75 Park growing up. For as long as I can remember, this park was neglected by the New York City Parks Department. And by the end of this journey, I am gonna find out why. poor black child from the ghetto. <laughs> These things make me different from you. Family's been in the Bronx forever. I mean, I don't think, uh, they were actually in the Bronx before it was called the Bronx, but it was still part of Westchester. I was born and raised here in the South Bronx, and I am currently standing in front of Lions Square Park. This is our home, you know, even though we have our houses where we sleep. By day, this is where we, we conjugate, this is where we recreate, this is us. 
these are the parks where people send their kids to play after school, where you might walk your dog or where you'll take your toddler to play in the sprinklers on a hot day. These really are at the heart of neighborhoods. I started asking questions. I started reaching out to people. And this park apparently is a, a really big deal. The Bruckner Expressway was opened in my neighborhood in 1973. According to the New York City Planning Department, this made it one of the last roads of the New York City Express system to be built. It was built so middle class, upper class citizens could cut through the Bronx and head into Manhattan for work. These are the parks that haven't seen much investment in the last 20 years and stand in contrast to the major parks projects that saw so much attention during the Bloomberg years. Race and class are extremely reliable indicators as to where one might find the good stuff, like parks and trees, and where one might find the bad stuff, like power plants and waste facilities. I'm really looking forward to the turnout to this park. It looks like it's going to be a great, interesting, new experience. We're very proud of the fact that this park is going to get a whole new renovation, a whole new facelift, like it's never seen before. to neglect parks in communities of color. Every pretty counts and it's important and we want to get more resources into low income parks. But why were they neglected for so long? Why these neighborhoods? Why these parks? Why my neighborhood? Why my park? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to say it's going to be my priority to make sure that every park gets the attention that it deserves. And um, as uh, the people who testified before you said uh, in part, and the commissioner said in part, it's a matter of resources in, in some cases. Um, and I've seen parks in very well-to-do neighborhoods as well that do not get the attention that they deserve. Mm -hmm. So um, it's about advocacy and it's about um, working with the elected officials, the community boards, and the people in this room who care about parks. And we're gonna push to make sure that um, the parks budget increases. Um, it was an initiative in 2001, 1% uh, for parks, which would be about 860, 880 million dollars, which would go a long way toward alleviating the problems that we have. So that's something that I am looking into now. Um, I do not control the budget of the city of New York, but I will be a very strong advocate. Nobody will be a stronger advocate for parks than I will. And as I said in my opening statement, my life revolved around my park growing up. It was two kids, it was stickball, four kids, it was basketball. And if we got 15 to 20, it was softball. That's how, that, those were the rhythms of my life. So um, those three acres were a piece of heaven for me. So I appreciate it. And uh, I am certain that Commissioner uh, Rodriguez Rosa will get to uh, the bottom of that park. And it, it seems to be under construction. I don't know if it's, Delayed, or is it, uh, where is the status now? It just finished, and we're waiting for the ribbon cutting. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> is it open, though? Yes. Okay, the ribbon cutting's not as important as the opening. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony this morning, and I look forward to working uh, with you uh, as we go forward. We're going to call up the next panel. Uh, Deb Deborah Martin or Martin, I, I Martin. Martin, okay. Uh, Lisa Ortega and Nilka Martin. I believe it's Martin as well. So they're all here. Okay. Deborah Martin, if you could start. <laughs> no, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where you sit as long as you have, as long as you have a voice. Yeah. 
Welcome, Chair. Congratulations. Thank you and very much. And it is much. Martin. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm Deborah Martin. I'm Executive Director of New York Restoration Project. We're a, ci a citywide conservancy focusing on open spaces in high need communities only. So that's parkland, but it's across all jurisdictions and including community gardens that we own and hold in public trust. We are very happy about the Ar Anchor Park and CBI, CPI, obviously, and uh, that's because we're driven by the belief that access to high quality open space is a fundamental right of every New Yorker for the reasons that you just eloquently pointed out. Um, not just because they're pretty or good for recreation, but everyday science tells us, and there's more and more accumulation of evidence that access to nature and open space improves mental and physical health, it reduces crime, and it encourages economic growth. Because of all this, our city's shared, shared land is the foundation of equity. It's that fundamental to everything else that happens in our city. At NYRP, we've been active participants in both the High Bridge and the St. Mary's Park Anchor Park visioning. Uh, we have seen the commitment of fellow community-based organizations as the project process moves forward for sound. At High Bridge Park, we are the conservancy of record. So we've been working closely with the Parks Department on the uh, visioning and um, I want to say that the Parks Department has done an excellent job in prioritizing community priorities that have existed there for decades, like addressing uh, deteriorating infrastructure, poor pathways, neglected entrances, um, and, and similarly at St. Mary's, they've been very responsive. St. Mary's, uh, we're a member of the Healthy and Livable Mott Haven Coalition. That includes uh, the Depart New York City Department of Health. It includes uh, Bronx's Blooming, New York Roadrunners. So it's a broad group of 15 neighborhood organizations. It's been integral to promoting active park use for a long time now with programs like Second Saturdays that delivers free health activities uh, from May to October. Uh, Anchor Parks is driving tremendous improvements, but we still need investment for programming and coalition building that's exemplified by the Healthy and, li healthy and Livable Mott Haven. Uh, recent studies by the RAND Corporation, which is an independent policy research organization, show that programming and community investment in local parks is the single biggest driver of use. Uh, groups like Healthy and Living, Living, Livable Mott Haven have provided important programming and continue to do that, but for this work to grow and to be sustained over time, it will require support in marketing, programming, and planning resources. We recommend that the council develop an annual funding initiative like Parks Equity or Greener NYC, which I have to say NYRP has been a recipient of and we're, we're very grateful for that. And that allows us to do programming both in our parks and community gardens. That would demonstrate an ongoing investment to the idea that social justice and environmental justice are inseparable and that our open spaces are strongest when communities lead in their stewardship programming and ultimately in their care over time. If you could send me an outline on what you'd like to see funded in the initiative. Um, I obviously can't promise, I don't, yes. I never promise. You'll never hear me promise anything, <laughs> or very, very rarely, I should say, um, except that I'll be somewhere. But, um, but I would be curious to see what you have and to see maybe whether or not it could become part of the parks initiative that we already have. Um, but I look forward to hearing from you on that. Thank you, I will send that and I will say that the most important thing that happens in parks happens after the ribbon cutting. There's no question. <laughs> right. Um, the most important thing that happens in parks is whatever people do. And, yes. And our parks, as I said in my opening statement, they mean as many people as we have, that's what they mean to those people. Exactly. So, yeah. um, you know, I don't play basketball anymore, but <laughs> I do play golf now, so. <laughs> Miss Ortega? You got to press the button. Did it try? It should be working. Yeah, now I got it. Yeah. You got it. Um, just real briefly, I just wanted to say that for community, re before I introduce myself, before um, community members are told that we matter, we need to change the process in here because having council people have round twos and talk about personal trees when we have community members who are left at the end to speak where people are leaving is truly disrespectful. It makes well, me feel like it's a horse and pony show and it's, lip service. It's, it's not. Unfortunately, this is a yeah. very busy day. Right. For I just wanted hearing. to comment that the process itself is I actually horrible. moved the hearing from the Should 26th to today yeah. because it was even busier on Monday. That's what I appreciate about. your comments but though. Yes. 
However, my name is Lisa Ortega and I have lived in the Bronx and I'm part of a, a grassroots organization called Take Back the Bronx. We have utilized Lions Park, AKA PS75 Park for over 24 years. In our South Bronx section of the Bronx, Lions Park represents many things to us. Some of the history of Lions Park has not always been good. There has been many shootings and fights and the park had been left to decay. My own son was shot in the face in that park at 19 while playing basketball, resulting in the loss of his right skull and his right eye. And to this day, he suffers from seizures. Even with these horrific events such as this that have taken place in that, in that park in the past, it has always been our park regardless. We, the community, made the memories there. Mixed in with some of the unfortunate events that took place there, we also had birthday parties, relaxed, enjoyed, had conversations while our children ran in the sprinklers and played with one another. Now more than ever, there is a great opportunity for Lions Park to become a place of healing, reclaiming, bonding, and rebuilding for our, our community ties. Since the park has been reopened, there has been a sense of hope that once again, beautiful memories can be made there. Being able to have access to the Partnership for Parks Catalyst team, members such as Yami, Linda, and Ted has been instrumental for us. They have provided a space and facilitated meetings where we were able to come together as a community and put forth our visions for a park. Many of us had different ideas and strong personalities, which the Catalyst team members helped us to put into concrete short-term and long-term goals for our park. It was helpful and much needed. It gave us the opportunity to rebond with one another and work as a unified force. Realistically, resources are needed to ensure we're able to have programming happening that engage our community in positive activities. The physical improvement are a priority as well. New updated and safe equipment in our park is a must for us to fully utilize our park and feel safe with the ch young children playing there. Oftentimes in low income areas of color such as ours, we are forgotten and expected to make do with what we have. I suppose it's because it is what we already do, so we get overlooked. I'm here today to let council members know that our community and our children deserve to have access to the same monies and services as other more affluent neighborhoods have, and we expect that the funding continue to flow. Thank you for your time and, and attention in this matter. Thank you for your testimony. I'm sorry to hear about your son. Um, I think that um, this administration, and I've taken them to task for other things, but they have certainly shown, and, and Commissioner Silver has shown a commitment to parks that were neglected, and that was the, the basis of this hearing to see how they're doing. Uh, we hope that, and we asked them about that today, myself and several other council members asked them about that, and I will be asking him next month at the preliminary budget um, to see if we can continue this. And it is um, a commitment that I'll make uh, today, I've already made, to increase funding for parks, uh, the baseline, um, because we can talk all day about what we'd like to see in our parks, but at the end of the day, it does take, it takes the narrow money, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we will continue to push for that, and we need advocates like yourself um, because that's what elected officials like myself respond to, to be quite frank with you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Ortega. Uh, Ms. Nilka. How are you? Good morning. You look good. Uh, my name I'm is good. Nilka Martel, founder of Loving the Bronx. We are the stewards of Virginia Park and Hugh Grant Circle, two beautiful parks within, a com within the Community Parks Initiative Zone. That's District 18, uh, City Council District. what part of the Bronx is that? Uh, Park Chester. Okay. Yeah, right when you get off the train station. Since their reopening in 1956, the public has not had access to these fenced off parks. We are elated to know that both parks will be renovated through the Parks Without Borders initiative. Are they public parks? Or are they they are. They're public parks with fences, with locks that you can look at the green space. So they're not open? Or are they open? Well, through or? the Parks Without Border initiative, they will be. At okay. least Hugh Grant Circle would be. Uh, okay. Virginia Park has a large green space, which is fenced off, and then a sitting area. So you are, you know, you can go to Virginia Park and sit in the sitting area, but you don't have access to the green space at all. Okay. So we're, you know, of course, Parks Without Borders initiative is, you know, great for us because we'll see these renovations and is we'll actually have access. Is there a reason that they've given access. you why they, f I, I know? Uh, no, they were reconstructed, they were re uh, renovated in 1956, and when they were, they were, they were, those fences came up. Okay. Uh, last year, through the help of Partnerships for Parks, Loving the Bronx received a $5,000 grant from our City Council members' Park Equity Initiative Funds. We held a series of Fun Friday events, weekly themed programming, providing free community events at Virginia Park. 
We were able to host 17 events and two It's My Park Day community service events. Partnerships for Parks also provided Loving the Bronx with an additional $23,000 from the Parks Equity Initiative funds for this year's programming. We have over 20 events planned at Virginia Park and Hugh Grant Circle for 2018. None of this would be possible without the help of Partnerships for Parks and funds made available through the PEI. So we look forward to further activating our local parks and green spaces to ensure that they're serving the public. And as volunteers, we are grateful for the Parks and Equity Initiative Fund so that we can further enhance our parks and programming. Thank you. And, and who's your council member? Uh, right now, it's uh, Senator Diaz. I don't well, think that he's active he's a new right one. now. Yeah. OK, OK. Yes. He's here. He's here. He's active. Uh, so thank you for your testimony. And thank, thank you, you for your work. Thank, and thank you. you for being involved. Four seats. We're going to add a seat, Mr. Sergeant at Arms, please. Um, Marcel ne Negret. If, if I'm mispronouncing your name, I'm sorry. I do pay attention to such matters because my name is constantly butchered. Uh, Lucy Coteen, Anita Reyes, and Marilyn Johnson. This will be the last panel unless somebody else signs in now. So, um, Marcel, I think he's you're outnumbered over there. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, hello, thank you so much. My name is Marcel Negret. I'm a project manager at the Municipal Arts Society of New York. Today, I want to raise attention to a specific type of park, which is classified as jointly operated playgrounds. Yes. Uh, and MAS believes that jointly operated playgrounds are crucial Thank to the you. provision of quality and accessible parks and open space in the city, particularly in underserved neighborhoods. Uh, G JOPs are defined as uh, operated by one by one by more than one agency, the Parks Department, and typically uh, the Department of Education. Uh, the city has consistently acknowledged the importance of playgrounds in achieving its long-term open space goals and improving park equity. Contrary to these efforts, a recent development initiated and approved by the city at the Marx Brothers Playground in East Harlem sets a dangerous precedent that may put many JOPs at risk throughout all five boroughs. In response, MAS urges the city council to uphold the city's long-term vision, treating parks and open space as essential components of New York's neighborhoods. Um, there are 116 JOPs within the CPI zones. They provide over 144 acres of open space and recreation opportunities. There's a map uh, behind uh, the testimony uh, highlighting the geography of the CPI zones and those uh, GOPs that overlap. Uh, there's about a, about a dozen GOPs within the CPI zones that are currently receiving capital funding under the CPI uh, uh, initiative. Uh, based on the latest available census data and the parks properties data set, the open space ratio, which is an indicator of the degree to which neighborhoods are served by open space, uh, it's uh, 0.93 acres per 1,000 residents within the CPI zones. This is 30, 38% below the city's median of 1.5 acres per 1,000 residents, or 63% below the city's goal of 2.5 acres. Without GOPs, these neighborhoods will be further underserved by open space, which would have long-lasting adverse impacts on the quality of life of residents and widen the gap of city to achieve its open space goals. Uh, in addition, GOPs have figured prominently in the city's open space policy and have been continuously identified as key, infra key infra infrastructure necessary to accomplish citywide and long-term open space goals. When NYC ident identifies playgrounds as having an important role in creating these neighborhoods that promote an active and healthy lifestyle. GOPs make an indispensable contribution to one NYC's objective of increasing the percentage of adults and high school students that meet recommended levels of physical activity. Um, so I just wanted to highlight this because, as I said in the beginning, there's a, a, a project that's putting at risk Marx Brothers Playground, MAS, and uh, in, 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 with several other prominent civic, civic organizations has filed a lawsuit to prevent this, which would uh, put 
a, a, a private developer to construct a 700 foot residential tower on that site. So without that, uh, I, we think this is a very dangerous precedent for all these GOPs. Uh, I, I hope I, I made my point, but if you have questions. You did, and I, and you. I have met um, with the director of the Municipal Law Society, Ms. Goldstein, and we have discussed this uh, for a while. So, but I'm glad you made it on the record today, so thank you. Thank you, I, I also have copies if people are interested. Okay, Thanks. Yeah, that uh, Ms. Coteen, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Correct. Okay. We've had problems with that one. Yeah, how's that? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Lucy Coteen. I'm representing an organization called Friends of Fort Greene Park today, um, and I will begin. The city has a policy to increase shade tree canopy by 30% by 2030, referred to as 30 by 30. Knowing as you must that the city plans to increase resiliency and decrease stormwater runoff, how does it fit to cut down 58 mature shade trees, some as tall as 60 feet, and remove two large earthen mounds by noted landscape architect A.E. By, which places another 14 large trees at risk given the city resiliency policy. And I just want to say I'm sorry Costa has left because I wanted to talk to him further about the resiliency issue. I'm here to discuss the PWB plan for the northwest corner of Fort Greene Park. The Parks Department plans to spend $10.5 million here for a totally unnecessary and wasteful new design plan that involves removing 58 large trees and building a 43-foot wide hardscape plaza. NYCHA residents that are directly across the street from the park use this park extensively. This is a widely used park by school children, athletes, mothers with children, public housing residents, and has a wide diversity of use by all races and religions. The few NYCHA residents who know about the plan are totally opposed to the redesign. Yes, they do want the Myrtle Avenue sidewalk rebuilt, which was allowed to fall into a disgraceful condition. They do want the torn up cement paths rebuilt, new lighting and benches, a basketball court repaved, increased barbecues, and an increased workout center. They do want the poor drainage issues resolved. They do not want the two large mounds that are used by all removed, beautiful big shade trees removed, this border stone wall removed, and a large hardscape plaza that will invite commercial, commercial usage into the park built. The concept that the park needs to be open to the street and that trees need to be clear cut so that an unobstructed view of the monument is created strikes park users and local residents as beyond absurd. No one has asked for this. The people in the area truly appreciate the border that surrounds the park and the separation from the hustle and bustle of the street. If you want to talk about equity, then talk about consistent maintenance in the park and giving park users what they want. The Parks Department frequently gave misinformation to the people in public discussions and community meetings and to the community board and did not listen to the community people who attended these meetings. The only way we could get factual information about the trees was through the FOIL process. There was no transparency from the Parks Department. They refused to give information when requested. The one thing all park users agreed upon was the need for a new or renovated comfort station. The Parks Department said that rebuilding the comfort station would come under operating budget and not capital budget, therefore it did not fit into their $10.5 million budget. As we all know, money is fungible not only that, but I, ha but I have a list of nine public bathrooms being built with capital money, which was provided to me from the controller's office. You should know that Public Advocate James' request for an EIS has been ignored. Almost done. Okay. With so many parks needing funding, why is the Parks Department allowed to spend excessively on project plans that no one asks for and no one wants? There are too many needs in the city to waste money where not absolutely essential. As one NYCHA resident asked, how is it possible that we can go without heat for a week in freezing weather when right across the street from us they are planning to spend money to remove beautiful big shade trees that benefit the neighborhood and create something and create something that we don't want? I wish I had known about this plan earlier so I could protest it. I was never informed. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Coteen. Ms. Reyes? Good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm, yeah, Honorable good afternoon. representatives of the City Council, my name is Anita Reyes. 
Thank you for inviting me to testify today on the impact that Mayor de Blasio's Community Parks Initiative, or CPI, has made on the neighborhood that I grew up in and that today is still home to most of my family. First, though, let me tell you a bit about myself. Born in the Bronx in the early 70s. Me too, but not in the early 70s. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I was the first American citizen in my family. Both my parents came from the Dominican Republic as teenagers and labored most of their lives in factory jobs to ensure my siblings and I got a good education. We lived near the corner of Fayle and Aldo Street in what we then called the Morrisania section of the Bronx, a rough neighborhood if ever there was one. My sister was stabbed Jeez. to death at 18. My brother died a, a gunshot at 20. Today, fortunately, the neighborhood is a much friendlier place than it was when I was 19 or 20. Lion Square Park is one of those reasons why that's the case. The park, one square block in the shadow of the elevated Bruckner Expressway, has recently been renovated thanks to the Mayor's Community Parks Initiative. The park has been transformed from a desolate, crime written patch of concrete buzzing with bullets into a bright spot in a neighborhood that now has hope. The physical improvements to the park inspire neighborhood residents to care about their park. I cannot tell you how important this is to me and my family. For immigrants from a different country, Lions Square Park was our patio, or backyard. For all its problems and safety issues, it was still all we had. Today, it's still all there is for many people in the nearby area, but the CPI has made that all it is all there is, a whole lot better. I, along with scores of residents and stakeholders, thanks to the Parks Department and Partnerships for Parks Catalyst Program, have now begun the process of activating the park, or in plain English, making sure that the community is organized, the park used properly, and that its programs serve the widest variety of people. Everyone doesn't always agree on what's best. We're New Yorkers, no, or we Bronxites. <laughs> <laughs> um, after all, but we do all agree that it can never go back to the way it was before. Thank you for your support of the CPI. On behalf of Lion Square Park, I hope you'll see fit to continue and even increase your support for the park and other parks like it in high needs areas across the city. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry for your losses that you described here today. Um, there's no going back. Uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I grew up in uh, public housing in the 1960s. It was a wonderful place to live. I can remember the days when my parks, because there was no bottle bill, was littered with the debris of all the bottles that were broken and all the glass. We had a very dedicated parkie, um, but he was hard pressed to keep up with all the garbage there. Uh, that park has been transformed, even though I thought it was an oasis as a child. Um, we had a night league for softball, which helped with public safety. And when the lights went out, there were local three electricians in the league, and they brought in their own bucket truck and fixed them themselves um, because, you know, it was the 70s and we couldn't wait um, for fixing. So uh, we're not going to go back. Um, this city has moved um, so far forward, um, but it's important that um, we all move forward together and that no park is neglected. Uh, that is not always easy to accomplish, but I know that myself and the members of this committee and, and our speaker, uh, Corey Johnson, uh, is dedicated to our parks, and I look forward to working with you and people like yourself. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, and the last person of the day, Ms. Johnson. Hmm. You share the surname with our speaker, so I'll give you an extra minute <laughs> for that. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Marilyn Johnson. I, um, I work as a parent coordinator at East Bronx Academy for the Future. I am the founder of Synergy Community Improvement Association. I am a community board three member, and I also founded Neighbors Helping Neighbors. I've lived, worked, raised my children, shopped in my community for the past 35 years. Whew. When I, um, the park that I'm discussing is Seabury Park, which is right adjacent to my school. Uh, when I first moved to the area, Seabury was a nice place. It was maintained well by the Parks Department. 
and there was a Seabury daycare center right next door to it, and we used to take the children there on a daily basis when it was nice out. But over the past 30 years, I've seen this park deteriorate. I've seen it grow. I've seen it um, drug dealers and bottles and prostitution and drug transactions and fights and um, needles and all kind of things left in the park when it was unattended. Thank God that we had the opportunity to work with Partnership for Parks and get this renovated. Um, we had an opening ceremony and a ribbon cutting, et cetera, et cetera. I personally would like to be a steward of the park because I'm the only one in that particular per particular area that actually lived in the community and have, um, we partnered with, I have a speech here, but I can't, <laughs> I'm not focusing. Um, we sent you guys some pictures to talk about the things that we've done in the park. We worked with several community-based organizations over the years, which was um, Synergy Community Garden 2.0, Future Star Productions, Wet Co, Mid Bronx Desperados, and quite a few more. We received a grant this year, 2017, to be a partnership <coughs> with Parks Visioning Cohort. Um, Leilani was our pre was our point person. We went down to Gold Street, me and my team, and we um, worked on our visioning projects and how we wanted to see what we wanted to see in the park. We was given a lot of resources and a lot of tools to help us to continue to build our community. We also worked with MED and the local farmers came um, in front of the park to sell fruits and vegetables, but we dismantled that relationship because they was bringing soil fruits and vegetables and things with bugs in it. And our seniors and our students was going over there and our families was eating their products and we didn't want to have a relationship with that um, farmer's market anymore. We have rallied, we have petitioned, we have done so many things inside and outside of that park to help to maintain it. We've planted, we work with the gardener with the, from the parks department. We've planted flowers and, and herbs and things like that. And we've seen it, seriously, go down. My point is, I'm happy to be a part of a grant that we received um, in 2016 um, to revise not only that park, but Synergy Garden, which is a few blocks away from that area. I think that the Parks Department does great work, and I continue to work with them and be a part of the process. My thing is maintaining afterwards, because a lot of times there's money going into different areas and communities, and there's no maintenance afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson, and, and I think you hit it on the head. Um, we can build the nicest parks in the world, but if we don't maintain them, then it's kind of useless. Um, and the parks are what we make of them. You know, they are our parks, and we all have our favorite park or favorite parks, and so it's important that we be involved. And so many of the organizations that are here today are working uh, with communities across New York City uh, to make sure that people are involved, they get involved, and they remain involved. And through those efforts, because people use parks, um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get a larger share of the New York City budget going forward. I also want to note uh, the uh, we've been joined by Councilman Borelli. Thank you. I mentioned Conference House Park. The greatest number of park acres. He's got more park. You have the most park acres? Okay. Even bigger than Mark Joni with Pelham Bay Park? Okay, yes, five. We were also joined by, uh, by Eric Ulrich as well. Um, with that, uh, seeing no other testimony, I am going to close this hearing. I thank you all for being here today, and I look forward to seeing you uh, for the preliminary budget hearing in March.